Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog and join the Progressive Army. Welcome to the Benjamin Dixon Show. I am your host, Benjamin Dixon. Today is Thursday, January, let's see, 23rd, 2020. Thanks so much for joining us. There are so many things that are happening in the news. Uh, but the first thing I want to start with is this clip that is about two years old from MSNBC. Uh, it is a clip that tries to explain to the MSNBC audience what democratic socialism is. Now, it's an old clip, but this was my first time seeing it. And um, uh, for you who are listening on the podcast, it'll be the first time for many of you hearing it. But I want you to listen to how they define democratic socialism as it compares to socialism and why when I go over the polling data, when I go over that polling data, you'll see. You'll see that MSNBC and their audience and the Democratic establishment, they need to get prepared for Democratic Socialism because Bernie is surging in the polls. And um, I think it's a reality that they're just going to have to come to terms with. All right. So listen to this clip from MSNBC as they try to um, comfort their audience with the definition of Democratic Socialism. The word most people focus on is socialism. But while Democratic Socialists pull some ideas from that ideology, they are not traditional social socialists Socialist. there is no Socialist. call for communal ownership of production here's what else it is not communism most people use communism and socialism interchangeably even Karl marx but communism is a political ideology while socialism centers more on economics they're related but none of this has to do with democratic socialists what they do call for is the enactment of certain socialist ideas through the democratic process, meaning everyone has a vote on whether they are a good idea or not. Mm -hmm. In many countries, democratic socialists work alongside other parties in broad coalitions. <laughs> Their goal is to control prices of essential services like medicine, banking regulations, affordable education, and the ability to work. All sounds reasonable. All of that is in the effort to minimize economic inequality and allow everyone in society to not just survive, but have the ability to thrive and enjoy life, a concept they call bread and roses. Fancy that everyone has an opportunity to survive and thrive, not just survive, but also thrive. Um, so let's start here. Democratic socialism, you know, it has. No, I want to go back a little bit further. Remember when they called uh, Barack Obama a socialist? It was the scariest thing. Um, that they had in their arsenal. And actually, I'm kind of grateful that they did that, right? Because from 2008 until 2016, every single day, every major right wing media outlet, radio station, uh, television, all of them constantly pounded the fear drums of socialism, socialism. And then they got real fancy and did a whole chain of them. Socialist, Maoist, communist, fascist, Leninist, right? They slid in fascist just for the scare tactic, not for consistency of ideological thought. But I digress. So for eight years, they did that and scared the entire bejesus out of the entire country that Barack Obama was a socialist. When in reality, we all now know those of us who thought that he might have been something like a democratic socialist. We now know that Barack Obama was your standard fair capitalist. He was your standard fair neoliberal who fits right into the um, the economic paradigm of Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton. Right. That is where we've been for the last 30, 40 years in this country, somewhere between uh, Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton is far closer to Ronald Reagan than he is an actual socialist. So the point is, is because they made everyone so fearful of socialism for so long. It began to wear off, you know, it didn't have the same impact. People weren't as concerned or as afraid of it because they heard it every single day. Enter in Bernie Sanders, 2015, Elizabeth Warren decided not to run and uh, Bernie Sanders did. And he comes in full throated, unapologetically a democratic socialist or a social Democrat, depending on who you argue with, right? I'm going to use those interchangeably. And if you want to send me a correction, that's quite fine, but whatever. So, he, you know, he came out full throated in terms of democratic socialism. And as you look at, at Bernie Sanders, you have to be really clear about who he is and who he's not. Right. I describe him as post office socialism. Right. I describe him as firefighter socialism because it is exactly what America has been doing for a very long time. It's something that we have had ingrained in our society 
for a very long time. So he's not Bernie Sanders is not a radical. This is what I, I, I say to people all the time when they say, oh, he's too radical. Like, no, Bernie Sanders is not a radical. I know radicals, right? I can't even say that I hang out with radicals so much because I used to, but we just see we don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. Bernie Sanders is the compromise. Bernie Sanders is as friendly as an offer as as this society is going to get. And democratic socialism is merely saying we can have this system. We can reform this system. Yes, they they are reformers. They're not revolutionaries. They are reformers. And they're saying we can revel- we can reform the system to the point where everyone can thrive. Everyone can get beyond just mere survival. They can actually thrive. Listen to the second part of the clip from MSNBC. And if you think some of these ideas are too alien to American culture, take a look at this. Social Security is a pension system run by the government. Mm-hmm. Medicaid and Medicare are government-run medical services. Mm-hmm. Even Amtrak is a government-owned transportation system. All of these are hallmarks of democratic socialist policy. Right. This- exactly. There's nothing about Bernie Sanders' platform, nothing that he's trying to do that is remotely outside of what America has already done or other nations like the UK. I, I, I said it on the show yesterday, and I've said it many times. The UK has had a single payer style system since 1949, 70 years, 71 years now, 71 years. They have had a single payer system where people in their uh, their citizenry can just go get treated and go home without having um, a, a enormous medical debt. Right. So they have had that for 70 years. And here we are in the United States of America, leaving all of our citizens at the at the mercy of capitalists making a profit off of people dying with cancer. So what Bernie Sanders is proposing and what Democratic socialists are proposing, it is nothing outside of the norm. It is nothing that's terrifying. Uh, It's it's again what I called at the beginning of the show. It's post office socialism. It is as American as the post office. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon show. All right. Special thank you to all of our newest patrons. Welcome aboard to Nello. I'm not Nello. With all respect, I am not going to even attempt your last name. Nello G. Thank you so much for becoming a patron. Very special thank you to William M. for increasing your pledge. A very special thank you to uh, Penelope. Thank you for increasing your pledge and very special thank you to Derek for increasing your pledge. You too can become a part of this prestigious and prodigious patron family by going to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show. And if you are listening to the show live or watching the show live on YouTube, you can do something extra cool and throw some money in the super chat. If I even have it set up. Mike Pence doesn't brag about sexually assaulting women. Grab him by the p- <laughs> I can do anything. Mike Pence doesn't pressure foreign governments into investigating his political rivals. Ukraine should start an investigation into the Biden. Mike Pence doesn't mock and make fun of people with handicaps. You got to see this guy. Oh, I don't know what I said. Oh. Donald Trump is being impeached. It's time for President Pence. At least it's an improvement. <laughs> Uh, Okay, so that's an advertisement from uh, Defend Democracy. Actually, the full name of the organization is Defending Democracy Together. Um, They are a new organization that is trying um, to encourage President Pence to come to the front. I don't quite know that I agree that he is an improvement. Um, I do agree that. Well, here's why I don't agree that he's an improvement, because of the, the, the deception that things have gotten better. Right. And that things have settled down, um, coupled with Mike Pence's um, desire for a full blown theocracy. Right. He is a dominionist. He is a person who believes that this country should be run based on Christian principles and Christian principles alone, that Christianity has a preferred place in this country um, and is enshrined in the Constitution. And if it is not, he would be for adding a constitutional amendment to enshrine Christianity as a privileged place in America. So I don't agree that Mike Pence is an improvement. Um, I think that he is actually far more dangerous. What I do agree with is that if we're dealt with, if we are dealt the cards that we are going to get President Pence, 
then fine, we'll deal with that as we cross that threshold. I don't believe that we should simply allow Donald Trump to stay in because of fear of President Pence, right? I don't think that we should allow the crimes of Donald Trump. Um, And I talked about this yesterday. Donald Trump, I I mean, we have become so accustomed to the, the, the frequency of Donald Trump's crimes that we fail to realize that any one of the things that Donald Trump has done over the last three years of his administration, just just take any day, any single day, any single uh, uh, controversy, hell, any one of his tweets would have been enough just before this. Like I'm not talking about going back to better times of 20 years ago. I'm talking about going back to more civilized times of the Obama administration with the caveat for everyone who's a leftist listening that's going to bring up the fact that he was droning and bombing everybody. Right. Okay. We're talking about domestic politics. I digress. Just in the Obama administration, if you take any single day, any single controversy, any single tweet, it would have been enough to grind our entire system to a halt until we address that issue. Right. But the sheer volume of Donald Trump's um, egregiousness, his 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 complete shamelessness, the sheer volume of it is why he's able to get away with so much. And so I say all that to say that Mike Pence, though he's not an improvement because of his ideal, um, his ideological leanings. Um, we have to hold. We have to hold Donald Trump accountable. There's just no way that we cannot go through the process of impeachment, even if that means he's going to be found not guilty. Obviously, he will be. But but we have to hold him accountable at some point. And all of the things that are being entered into the record are going to be damning throughout history because it will be accessible to people in the future, uh, to historians looking back on this time. And they will be able to give a clear eyed view of what happened, even if we're not capable of stopping it right now. So, again, I don't agree that uh, Mike Pence is an is an improvement, but I agree that it is time for President Pence because of the sheer volume of uh, of crimes and shamelessness of Donald Trump. Caller, you're live on the air. What is your name, comment, and or question? Hey, this is Aaron. I'm from Maryland. Aaron, and, uh, how are you, sir? Originally born in D.C., but I was just saying that the go-go portion that you play yeah. for the patron party, I got to say that cranks. That's always me in the comment section. Fat <laughs> laces the Don. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, but uh, my question is, uh, did you see the tape of Joe Biden coming oh. at the reporter aggressively? Yes. After being questioned about Bernie Sanders and his attack ad or whatever, you admit an attack ad against Bernie Sanders. And what are your thoughts on Joe Biden, like the continuous gaps and that right there being the icing on the cake? It's like the gaps aside, that was already bad enough. Right. But that in combination with like the aggressiveness and how he said that he wants to fight Trump, how would he fare on the stage with him? And what do you make of this like aggressive behavior towards the media that they aren't going to capitalize on because they only seem to worry about Bernie Sanders in comparison to Trump, but this guy, yo, sorry, my bad. No, no, you good, man. I'm, I'm enjoying the call. Appreciate the call. Uh, so in terms of, um, in terms of that clip, um, I, I'm actually going to play that clip in a moment. And I guess this is as good a time as any. Uh, to drop it in there. Um, but it was hilarious. And uh, I, I actually entitled the clip. Uh, Joe Biden is going to body somebody eventually. Right. It's inevitable. Um, so take a listen to this clip and um, the intensity, the frustration, um, the how irritable he is with this reporter. Uh, you know, it's funny if he does body slam a reporter, he, he might actually go up in the polls. But in terms of how he will handle and fare against Donald Trump, that's a more serious question. Take a listen in. Well, yesterday, yesterday you said you accepted Bernie's apology and now you're attacking him. Why are you doing that? Why wasn't his apology enough, Mr. Vice President? Why, why attack Sanders? Why, 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 you're getting nervous, man. Calm down. It's okay. He apologized for saying that I was corrupt. 
he didn't say anything about whether or not I was telling the truth about Social Security. Thank you guys. We gotta so, <laughs> If you see the video, it's even worse than than the audio. Right. So you have to see the video to get the full impact of it. But Joe Biden really snapped. And like it's kind of difficult to talk about Joe Biden without sign, sounding like I'm ageist. Um, and kind of as an aside, I actually empathize with him. Uh, my father really started to get uh, seen now um, in his early 60s, like late 50s. Um, so it's a good possibility that it's going to hit me. Because I don't know, you know, I haven't studied it. I don't know how genetic it is, but it, you know, my grandmother got senile and my grandfather and my father got senile. So it's a good possibility that that shit's going to hit me too, right? So I empathize with them, um, but it's a thing, right? It's really a thing. And it comes out, um, it comes out in the debate. You see, he has a hard time remembering things. He has a hard time making a coherent sentence. And to be quite honest, Joe Biden needs to be somewhere just enjoying his twilight years instead of being propped up for uh, for the for the benefit of consultants who need to make a dollar. Right. That's really what this is. The reason Joe Biden is traveling around the country being exposed to scenarios that he, quite frankly, can't handle anymore. Forget about his record. Right. We can we can destroy Joe Biden on the sheer uh, virtue of his of his record. But setting that aside, Joe Biden today does not have the wherewithal to go around the country and engage in any number of circumstances that would otherwise. I mean, come on, he's going to body somebody one of these days. He's going to body slam one of these reporters who who is really aggressive with them. But that's the nature of political campaigning. That's number one. Number two, he is not going to be able to handle Donald Trump. Now, I'm saying all this. And quite frankly, Donald Trump is a unique threat to our democracy. And if Joe Biden gets the nomination, I don't know if I'm going to put on a Joe Biden T-shirt, but I'm most certainly going to uh, encourage everyone to vote for him. Right. You in the audience do whatever you want to do. I'm, that's just what I'm going to do. But we can avoid that nightmare scenario by realizing right now that he is not up to the task of going up against Donald Trump, who, for whatever reason, you know what it is? Evil people, their brains stay sharper a lot longer, right? People who are just fueled off of nothing but pure uh, egocentrism, like they are just uh, self-absorbed, uh, the bigotry. It's really easy to remember that kind of stuff, right? Uh, and then Donald Trump is also uh, hocked up on, on nothing but McDonald's and steak and ketchup. So his, I mean, he's really... Donald Trump is going to go out with a bang, but he's sharp as a tack, right? He can't write a coherent tweet, but he most certainly can come off the cuff and and really throw Joe Biden a curveball that he's not going to be ready for. So to the caller's question, no, uh, that is a perfect example. That video clip of him with the reporter is a perfect example of why Joe Biden is not up to the task of going up against somebody like Donald Trump. Caller, you're live on the air. What is your name, comment, and or question? Hey, Ben, it's Max. Um, we've actually chatted in the past and done some cool stuff. Um, and I, being out of like the world of campaign consulting and work, I've gotten to notice this this rift mm -hmm. in our in our general left side of the spectrum that it's like the professional political workers um, from the nonprofit world seen a lot of them support war and more okay and then the labor people the campaigners the grassroots um folks like us who have been on the ground doing doing a lot of stuff to help progressives win mm -hmm. you know we like we like bernie yeah and my two cents on it and obviously you're gonna have something really good to say on this that's why i'm asking but my two cents is it seems like there's and michael brooks talks about the, the technocraticness of hmm. elizabeth warren and that's exactly what one of these folks has told me in the past is, well, she knows how to get things done and we need somebody who can get the technical things done. Mm. And I vehemently disagree with that. But I just I wonder if you've seen the same thing and I wonder what your thoughts on that are. 
Yeah, awesome. Um, I'll definitely answer that. Thanks for the call. So um, here's so I've made my foray into political consulting um, this this cycle. Um, I've done some consulting for a couple of campaigns and some, you know, messaging, whatnot, um, content creation, stuff like that. And in my short time, I have had the uh, privilege, I guess, unfortunate privilege of working with quite a few other consultants. Right. As soon as you jump in there, there you're introduced to dozens of consultants. And the reason I'm giving you that background is because I want to use that background, my short experience with it, um, to answer your question. It's not the um, technocratic side of Elizabeth Warren that they are after. It is trying to find a compromise to avoid the real revolution that Bernie Sanders is bringing. See, the, the revolution that Bernie Sanders is bringing isn't a socialist communist revolution. It's a revolution to K Street. It is a revolution to the consulting class. It is a revolution to all those people who sit back and wait till the election cycle comes in, the campaign cycle comes in, and they rake in millions. When I say millions, I mean millions. I know consultants who are making $200,000 a month, right? A month, not a year. I mean, a, a, a television ad buy in just Georgia could be upwards of a few million dollars and the consultant can get 10 to 20% of that. Uh, I mean, there's, there's just so much money that slushes around in campaigns that the consultant class is actually terrified of Bernie Sanders bringing in. Okay. So two things before I even finish that sentence, the flip side of it is, Bernie Sanders is bringing in a funding structure that will support that same system, right? Our small dollar donors, uh, donations to Bernie Sanders, they get all, you know, combined and they get distributed to a consulting class too. So I don't want to give the impression that I'm saying that Bernie Sanders is running a unique campaign in that he doesn't have some high price consultants on his price, on his uh, invoice, right? He certainly does. But I do think if there's ever a way for us to get money out of politics, the only candidate that's going to get us anywhere near getting money out of politics, it's Bernie Sanders. And that is a direct threat to the livelihood of people who make $10 million in a campaign cycle. Democratic consultants. Don't get me wrong. They are Republican consultants on the other side who are mirroring the same exact thing. So they are not supporting Hillary. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I guess Hillary Clinton. Um, they're not supporting Elizabeth Warren because of they're impressed with her um, technocrat. Um, how would I how would I put that word? Um, anyway, um, her, her being a technocrat. Right. They're not supporting her because of that. They're supporting her because she's not going to change that system. She's not going to change the money in politics. Um, I don't believe that she is. I think the reason she won't, even if she says that she will, is because there has to be a level of conviction that's willing to stick out the fight. This is why I don't think she's going to be real on Medicare for all. You have to have a level of conviction that when you get attacked with more money than you've ever been attacked with, that you don't flinch. Elizabeth Warren is going to flinch. Bernie Sanders is not. And that's why he's the real threat. I think that's the reason. Paula, you're live on the air. What is your name, comment, and or question? Uh, hi, Ben. Uh, this is uh, Roy calling from just outside of Chicago. How you doing, Roy? Um, Thanks for the call. I'm doing well. I'm actually a little bit surprised I made it. Um, uh, just, just uh, So basically my question is... Um, for my for myself, I think when I really started becoming a lot more, uh, let's say, politically awakened was really kind of with Bernie's kind of campaign, mm -hmm. um, especially in 2016. But especially when I saw he, he was coming back in 2020, um, is really when I started getting involved. I think um, I found Sam Cedar, uh, Michael Brooks, Kyle, yourself, mm -hmm. um, on and on, and I I, I try and be like let's say uh, uh, uh pretty pretty honest and fair at least in how i how i look at 
um, the candidate, right? I, I, I'm 100% for Bernie. Um, and so I know sometimes it's easy to, to just see the, to see the, the good or the positive right. of a candidate. And when I started to listen to your show a lot more, um, I saw that, like, of course, your, your support of Bernie Sanders, but you also had your own kind of reservations and reluctancies. Oh, yeah, which for sure. Obviously, me being very Bernie, like to a certain extent, it was a little jarring, but also refreshing because I do like to hear those honest criticisms about my candidate. Right, and right. So, um, kind of in that, I mean, I spent a lot of my time um, kind of discussing or debating some of my more um, moderate or 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 incremental friends online, and a lot of times they have this accusation that Bernie supporters just kind of view him as a god and so i was hoping you could maybe elaborate more on some of your own kind of um reservations on bernie so when 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 i need to be honest about issues that i, I i'm not that bernie isn't as strong on i mean i know i have a few um kind of his answers on reparations and xyz yeah but maybe if you could um go on on that a little bit more and by the way i'm i'm roymond on on twitter by the way so if you ever see okay. me just being a little bit foolish that that's just me <laughs> <laughs> All right. Appreciate the call, brother. You can join the conversation either live or in the chat room um, by calling in. But to answer the caller's question. So um, I have had my reservations. Uh, this is actually a great question. And here's why. I am full throated support, uh, supporting Don, uh, Bernie Sanders right now. Um, I have been tepid in my support for him up until this point. Um, and then I'll talk about why I was reserved in my support and what sent me overboard. I think everyone in the audience knows what sent me overboard. It was Hillary Clinton. Not just Hillary Clinton, there's a couple other people. But here, my reservations, I've covered pretty much um, ad nauseum, but I'll give it to you again. I support reparations. Um, I do have a problem with uh, Bernie Sanders' uh, stubbornness with regard to mastering the conversation about race. Not just making adjustments. His team has made adjustments, right? He's tweeting a lot better because he's not the person tweeting. Cool. No, no, no disrespect. I, you know, that's what happens. So I appreciate the, the change in the tone of his tweets. I appreciate the change in the tone of some of his content that they put out. Um, but when an interviewer gets him one on one, uh, you see the same stubbornness um, where he insists on looking at everything first, first and foremost through the lens of class. And the problem I have with that is. Well, that's not accurate for one, but then two, it becomes a political liability, a football that you give, a bullet that you give your rivals to attack you on a regular basis. That was the that was the basis of my main critique back in 2015. I'm like, don't give them anything that they could use against you because we need to get Medicare for all. Right. We need to get the programs that uh, Bernie Sanders is trying to give us. Um, fast forward to the end of the 2016 election. We had a really hard shift in, in independent media. That um, that really went to all out attacking identity politics. And I took a step back and I'm like, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. While weaponizing identity politics was a problem in the primary and it is a problem in general. Right. It's weaponizing identity politics is when when someone says you can't possibly criticize Amy Klobuchar because if you do, then you're a sexist. Right. That's weaponizing identity politics. Right. It is a problem. That is a problem. But identity politics is not a problem because every single one of us has an identity. Um, and the majority of us in this conversation, at least in progressive circles, we have an identity that that we have quite a few people come after us over. Right. The problems that we face, the problems that the LGBTQ community faces is specifically because of their identity. Right. The problems that we face with regard to race is because of our identity, the color of our skin. Right. So we are, we literally face issues that are identity specific. So you can't just simply shit on identity politics. Right. Um, and then there's the political side of it, because here, let's take Georgia, for example, in Georgia, the primary, the primary base, the Democratic primary base, the people who show up to vote in the primaries. Sixty percent African-American. Let me say that again. Sixty percent. Of the voting body, electorate, body politic that's going to show up in the primaries is 60% black. So if you're just going to shit on identity politics, then you're not 
a good person because you're disregarding our identity and the problems that we have based on our identity, right? But more importantly, you're not good at politics because that replicates itself across the country to varying degrees. 60% of the electorate during the Democratic primary. So if Bernie Sanders wants to win Georgia, God damn it, he's going to have to talk to us based on our identity. So those are the problems that I had with Bernie Sanders, his stubbornness. He's an old cat. He doesn't want to change his ways. And that's kind of why he's good, right? There's a lot of good things. There's, there's virtue to that because he doesn't have to stumble and fumble to justify bullshit like Joe Biden does. He just says what he has always been saying for the last 40, 50 years, um, 350 years. But he also... Um, it also becomes a stumbling block because he has to be able to speak to people based on their identity. And then we as a surrounding um, progressive community and independent, um, independent media community need to understand the difference between weaponizing identity politics and just trying to shit on identity politics in general. Um, and again, to dovetail the conversation, the reason I set that critique aside and said, hey, listen, I've got to support Bernie Sanders is because I need Medicare for all. Um, I'm getting old and there's going to, you know, my check engine light is going to come on eventually. I've been lucky up to this point um, because we need debt, student debt cancellation, because we need some change. We need some absolute changes to happen in our society. And. Well, quite frankly, if everyone else is going to use their platform, the Twitter platform, their media platforms in order to attack Bernie Sanders. You can't expect me to sit back and just be nice and be friendly while you're doing some rabid attacks. Right. So if we're not all going to play nice, then none of us are going to play nice. And you guys didn't really want to wake me up and turn and, 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 and turn me back into the 2016 Benjamin Dixon. Well, you did. And that's why we are where we are right now. All right. Questions from our chat room. Comparative reasoning wants to know, can you explain your full version of what is expected from reparations? Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, I, I've only this is only a 30 minute show and I've only got three minutes left. Um, here's what I support in terms of reparations. I think that there is a debt to be paid to the descendants of slaves. Absolutely. Um, I also think that there are the 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 vestiges of slavery are still felt um, both economically as well as socially right socially there was a, a tremendous tremendous efforts put into place to vilify and dehumanize black people that shit doesn't just go away just because we ended slavery and we gave us the right to vote uh, and it's only been what 50 years since we've had the right to vote um, the vilification of black people was ingrained in this country since the founding since before the founding right so you have the social ramifications that we still feel, but then you also have the economic ramifications. It's going to take black folks to get uh, the same amount of wealth that an average white family. We're not talking about billionaires. We're talking about the average white family. It would take black families 200 years to catch up with that. Right. So there's a the social ramifications as well as the economic ramifications. And everyone looks at the black community and says, uh, just pull yourselves up by the bootstraps. You're lazy. No kiss our black asses because we have the data that shows that it is a direct line from slavery to the things that we're dealing with now. And if you don't want to address what happened to slavery, there's, we just got past redlining, right? We just got past the exploitative nature of credit in black communities. We just are getting beyond the, uh, the prison industrial complex. So there are things that are in the recent history of America that absolutely have to be paid. We have to be paid back for that, right? One form of, of, of reparations is said everybody, every person that has that is in jail right now because of marijuana possession and selling and trafficking and any anything, set them free and set them up with a business. Because what you're doing right now is we're moving into an industry where where uh, marijuana and cannabis sales are going to be dominated by white guys while the black people are in jail. See, now you didn't got me hyped. This <laughs> black people are in jail right now. For doing the things that people are becoming millionaires and billionaires around. Well, maybe not billionaires yet, but they will become. So there, there are literally direct things that can be done. Now, 
are we going to go all the way back to slavery? I think that requires some significant study and H.R. 40 that was routinely introduced into Congress by um, the late Congressman John Conyers. But H.R. 40 uh, was a study requesting a study so that we can trace and calculate what reparations would really look like, who they would apply to and whatnot. But at a minimum, even if we don't go back to slavery, we could just go back to Ronald Reagan and say, pay me what you owe me. OK, uh, another question um, coming from uh, um, who was that person? M.I.T.M. Adamsville. Um, he wants to know, do you like any of the candidates in the Georgia Senate primary so far, Ben? Yes, I do. Hmm. Full transparency. One of my clients is a candidate in the Georgia race for Senate. And um, I would tell you this. I would not have them as a client if I wasn't thoroughly convinced that um, they were the very best choice for Georgia. Um, and so before I even drop the name or anything like that, um, I just wanted to give you that full disclosure. I have a client that's in that race. And actually, that's all I'm going to say about it, um, because I want to do so I, I want if I when I introduce her to the audience, um, I want it to be meaningful and not just like a shameless plug kind of thing. But I do have a pick in the Georgia race and I'm working. I'm Well, she's a client of mine. I'm doing some consulting work for her. And when I tell you she's the truth, she's the truth. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing work. Uh, my other client, other client that and this honestly, like, what do I do to keep the lights on? Because, you know, patrons, thank you. You help me uh, do quite a bit. But my other work is I do some consulting. I just started it. And I have a client that's out in California. Um, she is she's amazing. And I have the luxury of working with people, uh, picking my clients and picking to work with the most progressive. And when I tell you these two women are damn more progressive than Bernie Sanders, I am not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. The only reason I haven't introduced you all to them yet is because I want to make sure that I walk the the, the journalistic integrity line. Uh, and so I'm giving you that disclosure first before I even tell you who they are and let you guys you know chew on that before I even introduce you to them. OK, next question from the chat room uh, from Kevin Moses. Me and Kevin Moses go way back. Before I say anything else, Kevin, remember, I always tell the story of friends who hammered me to the wall and wouldn't let me um, bend or relent until or, well, get away until I relented and reconsider my position on some of the things that, that I was transphobic about still. Um, right. All of us are works in progress. And I would say back in 2015, I wasn't the best when it came to trans issues. Um, Kevin Moses was one of those people. so. Um, big ups to Kevin. Uh, he said, going back to what you just said, do you think Warren is taking advice from Obama's strat, uh, stagers? And, uh, that created her thing with Bernie last week. So uh, staffers, I think you probably, yeah, instead of two G's, you probably meant F's Obama staffers. Yes. I think because the, I know correlation isn't causation, but Elizabeth Warren brought on some Obama, Obama staffers. Uh, three weeks ago and just about three weeks ago, we had this ridiculous uh, strategy or well, two weeks ago. We had this ridiculous strategy that was employed. The first one was um, complaining about the volunteer script. Right. And then the second one was at the debate or right before the debate talking about Bernie Sanders saying that a woman can win. I think there's just too much of a coincidence to not really take that into serious consideration. And um, that is that is the perfect example of weaponizing identity politics. That what happened last week, and it worked so well for Hillary. So, of course, they said they want to try it again. All right, everybody, that's the full show. Thanks so much for joining us. If you want to be a part of the live conversation, you can watch on YouTube anywhere. It's going to be I'm trying to get it at seven in the morning, but until then, it's at least before 10. <laughs> See everyone tomorrow. Take care. The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon Show. If you like this episode, be sure to share, like, and subscribe.